So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and pray that your spirit lead us and guide us as we're looking at what we believe to be present truth and we need your help to rightly divide your word. Pray you cleanse our hearts and minds. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. We covered this yesterday, uh, but I just want to go over it. I kind of drew it out a little nicer. It was a little scribbly because I do it when I'm uh, on the move in the presentation. So uh, I've titled this The Time of Judgment. If we look at Revelation, we can see six times that Yeshua returns the second time, the first time being 2,000 years ago. We also see a third time, uh, which is after the millennium, but we're not talking about that. We're talking today about the close of probation, the statement that we read earlier. We found that clearly in the prophecies. Go figure. In Daniel chapter 7, we read about the little horn, and we also read that there would be a time when judgment would be happening at the time that the little horn was speaking. So let's go to the chart, shall we? So we determined that the 1260 days was equal to the time, times and a half, and the 42 months that are mentioned seven times. It's the most focused on uh, prophetic time in all of the Bible. It's seven times referred to. So, you know, I've said the idea that it's got to be perfectly important seven times. But uh, it is absolutely important for us to understand. And going back to the statement that I made earlier, that many, because these prophecies are hidden in their own minds, they're in plain sight in Scripture, but because they won't take, thus saith the Lord, which we're going to be looking at, uh, they disregard these prophecies and put them into history. When I understand prophecy is actually future events foretold, uh, that's what prophecy is. Now we can gain a blessing when we see prophecy uh, fulfilled in the past. It gives us courage and uh, a good place to stand on the prophecies that are going to happen in the future. We can have confidence they will happen because of what has happened. But to place pretty much 99% of the prophecies in the Bible in the past locks these things up because people say, well, those prophecies are all fulfilled. And I talk to people all the time. All those prophecies are fulfilled. We're not looking at them. And it's the same idea that, you know, out back here, <clears throat> people used to run all over these hills to find gold. In the area that we live in, all through this area that we used to live in, People, people 100, 150 years ago scoured the country and these streams to find gold. And they found gold back then. But today, you don't find very many people finding gold, or you don't even run into them out here looking for gold. And why is that? Because they've been told, people have been told, that all the gold that was in the ground has been mined and it's not worth looking for anymore. And so if we can take scripture as gold, if we're telling people that all the gold has been mined in the scriptures, and these prophecies, as far as I'm concerned, are gold, if we say that it's all done in the past and there's really nothing more to happen, except for Sunday laws, then uh, why would we bother to look? And that's just what Satan has done. He's tied up the minds of the people for different reasons. And the best one that I can come up with is because he was so successful at the first coming, had people expecting, had his own people expecting his return in such a way that it wasn't going to happen, that when he came, they rejected what he was doing. And so because he was so successful at the first coming, I can't see how he'd miss that 
And somebody might say, well, no, we've learned all the lessons of the past. The Jews were, you know, they were way back then and they were foolish and, and they rejected God. Well, I'm not so sure that the church today would be in any better position than back then because I am becoming more and more convinced all the time that we have learned something from history and that is that we don't learn from history because we are indeed repeating the same mistakes that the Jewish people of old uh, did as well. And I'm not so sure if we would not be looking for stones to stone Yeshua if he came back in our day. In fact, the Bible tells us that they will make war against the Lamb, but of course the Lamb is going to overcome them. So my, my point being here is we are looking at the events connected with the close of probation that I believe are clearly presented in the prophecies. That's, I believe that with all my heart. So what we did here yesterday is we developed this chart. We have a 1260 day period, mentioned seven times, uh, 42 months, and time times and a half, twice in the book of Daniel, chapter seven and chapter 12, and five times in the book of Revelation between chapter 12, 13, uh, 11, 12, and 13. Um, and so we have that. All the time it's referring to a power that we first found in Daniel called the little horn. In the book of Revelation, it's not called a little horn anymore. It uh, morphs into uh, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. And the harlot controls the ten kings. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to briefly talk about that. I've got video presentations on that. But I want to cover the areas that surround the judgment. Why do I believe that's so important? I believe that when the judgment happens, the final... Actually, I need to reword that a little bit. This is not the final day of atonement that we're looking at here. In, we have trumpets, 10 days later, we have uh, Judgment Day, and I call it that the Day of Atonement, and we looked at the idea of 1150 days fitting into it from Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And so when we looked at that, we looked at why it couldn't be actually 2300 uh, days, but it is what it said, evenings and mornings, and if you have 2,300 evenings and mornings, you would actually have 1,150 days. And this is especially true, not in every case, but this is especially true in sanctuary language, which is what we find in Daniel chapter 8. So we saw here that the 1,150 is in answer to the question of the events that are transpiring under the rulership of the little horn. Why is this important? Because this is consistent with Daniel chapter 7, because the time frame in Daniel chapter 7, the focus for Daniel came onto the little horn because it was the one that was instigating the persecution of God's people. And so the time frame there, the time, times and a half, this time period was in reference to what the little horn was doing. And we see the same thing in Daniel chapter 8. The discussion is that we have a ram and a he goat, which we're going to be looking at. And also, then it goes into a division of four horns, and then out of one of them came a little horn. And the little horn does certain things, takes away the daily tramples the host and all of these things facing off against God. And then it says, how long? Okay, so we were looking at the concept that the 1150 days is in connection with the little horn. The questions asked, how long shall the vision be concerning the, the well, let's read it, shall we? Let's read this. In verse 13, then I heard, verse 13 of Daniel chapter 8, 
Then I heard a holy one speaking. Another one, holy one said to the certain one who's speaking, how long will be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation and giving the, both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. If the, if the answer to the question is in regard to the whole vision, I think he would have started it a little bit different in that how long will be the vision concerning the ram and the he-goat and the division of the four horns and the little horn? Well, if that was 2300, then that would span the whole vision. Um, but it doesn't. It doesn't say that. He focuses in here on the events connected with the little horn. And that is exactly what happened in Daniel chapter 7. So this is consistent. When the little horn comes on stream, he starts persecuting God's people, starts facing off against God, and that's where the focus now comes in the prophecy. And that's the answer to the question. So the answer to the question is directly related to what the little horn is doing. So here's my second point on that concept. If the little horn only gets 1260, and we get that from Daniel chapter 7, if the little horn only gets 1260 days, or 42 months, or time, times and a half, then the events of Daniel chapter 8, the 2300, whatever it is, has to fit within the time frame of the little horn. So it would have to be less than 1260 days. So when we take 2300, divide it into two segments, evenings and mornings, it should be noted that in the King James, when you get to verse 26, at which is the proper translation in this case, King James isn't perfect all the time, but this is what it actually says in the, in the Hebrew. It says, the vision, let's read it. In verse 26 of Daniel chapter 8, in mine, the new King James, it says, the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Does somebody have a King James uh, Bible? New King James is the same. Same thing. Okay. So the evening and the morning, two separate things referring, and this is, this is the way the Hebrew is, so it's, it's dividing this into segments uh, and in reference to the sanctuary, and again I say not always, but most of the time when the daily is referred or in reference to the sanctuary, it's speaking of the Tamid offering, which is the daily offering that happened twice a day, a morning and an evening, or evening in the morning, which we saw yesterday. And, uh, and very likely this is what it means, and the word daily is the same word that they use back in Numbers in reference to the morning and the evening sacrifice. That's why Bible translators uh, put the word sacrifice in, because to them it was obvious. But as we discussed yesterday, and if you haven't, I, I kind of labored on that point. We don't need to have the word in there. In fact, it's probably much better if it's not. Otherwise, we'd be looking for lambs to sacrifice. But we still experience the appointed times, which include the tamid or the daily appointed time. But we do not need sacrifices as far as animals are concerned. We have other sacrifices that we give, like praise and thanksgiving and offerings and so on. Uh, but definitely, um, I've opted not to sacrifice animals because Yeshua is my lamb. All right, so, so that's what we looked at yesterday. We also touched on it, but we didn't get really into it. We talked about another time period of 1290, and we also talked about another time period of 1335 days. Now, what we also talked about is that in the festival calendar, it's prophetic, as we've seen. We see that very clearly. 
And when we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 15 and 16, we see the seven last plagues. And we see the wording is very interesting, is it says that God has made manifest his judgments. Well, judgments, if God's going to make manifest and pour out his judgments on, on people, then there would have had to be a judgment prior to that. It's quite logical. Um, and that's what we see. We see a judgment in the sanctuary services, Leviticus 16, uh, also Hebrews chapter 9. And Paul talks about that God has appointed a day, I believe it's in Acts 27, God has appointed a day which he will judge the world in righteousness. So we know that, and that's a day. It's not a century or two centuries or a thousand or two thousand years. It's a day in which he will judge. So the final day of judgment uh, is on the Day of Atonement. I want to go back to what I said earlier. The events connected with the close of probation are clearly presented in the prophecies. This is what we have so far. We have a little horn, which is the harlot of Revelation 17. It's going to rain for 1260 days, so we can gear up for that. Revelation chapter 12 says the woman flees into the wilderness for how long? Somebody help me out. Three and a half years, time, times and a half. Exactly. So the people that are listening to God, it sounds like they flee into the wilderness for this time period. And they are protected, it says, from the face of the serpent who works through the little horn. Now, these are, connect, these, are, um, these are events connected with the close of probation. Are, am I clearly presenting what's going to happen at the close of probation? I hope so. That's my goal. Why do we need to do, do that? Because, evidently, we need to prepare. That's what it says. And the work of preparation for the time of trouble. What is the work of preparation? Well, number one, it would be spiritually. Number two, it would be mentally. A lot of people won't even read these prophecies because they can't handle what they're saying. So we need to mentally prepare for what's coming. And we also need to physically prepare for what's coming. Because if it's a literal uh, going into the wilderness, then we certainly need to prepare here in Canada where we live because we'd never survive. And Yeshua's words himself said that, that uh, pray that your flight be not in the winter. Uh, so, and that's because you'd never, in some places on the planet, you would never get to where you need to be for safety in the winter. So these are events we're talking about at the close of probation. So here's the close of probation. Has to happen within the time frame of the little horn. That's what the prophecy says. And... Uh, we learned that from Daniel chapter 7, the time that the little horn was speaking. We go into a judgment scene, and then it goes back, the little horn is speaking, and then it says his kingdom is taken away, and all he gets is time, times, and a half. So we cannot extend it past that time. So the judgment falls within the time frame of the little horn and begins, as we know, at trumpets. There's a 10 days of investigation, if you will, a judgment scene in heaven. The books were opened and the court was set. What, what are they opening, these books? So at the close of probation, if we understand the sanctuary, that's when our sins are transferred from the sanctuary because the record goes into the sanctuary through the blood of the Lamb that's sacrificed every day. That's where our sins go into this heavenly sanctuary where Yeshua has gone before us, our forerunner. And I was trying to explain this one time in a Mennonite Bible study, and they couldn't figure out why the heavenly sanctuary had to be cleansed. We were studying uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And so I started to explain this, that our sins actually in the Old Testament sanctuary were transferred to the animal, and the life of that animal, which now became tainted, was spilt. The life being the blood was spilt into a basin. 
And then the priest would sprinkle it on the horns of the altar and go into the altar of incense as well and sprinkle some of the horns uh, or the horns of the altar on the daily um, and the daily routine every day. And then on the Day of Atonement, the, the Lord's goat would be taken. That's Day of Atonement here. The Lord's goat would be taken and it would be sacrificed. But it's interesting to note that according to scripture, I'm not so sure if tradition will hold this up, but according to scripture, there are no sins transferred onto the Lord's goat. It is just sacrificed. However, the sins on the scapegoat, it says that Aaron puts his hands on the scapegoat and tra transfers not from one goat to another, not from the Lord's goat to another, but the sins that have been recorded daily in the sanctuary by the blood of the daily sacrifice. It's those sins that are transferred onto the scapegoat. And that's quite interesting because the Lord's goat, no record of sins being transferred to that goat on that day. Why is that important? That's because only pure blood can do away with your sin. So the record of your sins now on the Day of Atonement, that's this day, Day of Atonement, the priest takes the Lord's goat and sacrifices it, catches the blood, and it is pure because there's no sins transferred on there. And then he takes that blood, sprinkles it everywhere where the daily blood was sprinkled that had the record of sin. So the record of sin, what he's doing is actually covering the record of your sins and mine. And if we have accepted Yeshua as our sacrifice at this time, and with what all that means at that time, then our sins are forgiven. What about the scapegoat? On the scapegoat, Aaron confesses all the sins of not the world at this time, but those of the house of Israel. Why is that important? It's because Israel is said to be God's people. Now we have to understand what Israel is. You could be a bloodline Israelite and be saved. But my understanding is from scripture is that unless you accept Yeshua as your sacrifice, then you cannot be saved. So in the time of the end, there will be Israelites that accept Yeshua as their lamb, and they will be saved. However, in addition to that, Galatians, Paul tells us that if you're Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Abraham was the father of the Israelite nation, Jacob. And so if we are Christ, because Christ was a part of that house, if we are his, we are adopted into that family. And the way I'm reading it <clears throat> is God is no respecter of persons. And if we are adopted as aliens into the house of Israel, we become the house of Israel. And this actually makes a lot of sense when you get to the book of Revelation, because the only gates that are there, there's no gate that says Gentile gate. It's all uh, the house of Israel. So we're going to be going through one of those gates, which we will become part of the house of Israel. And this is to me, this is the gospel. This is what uh, the sanctuary was all about. How is God going to restore his people back to himself? And, and this is all part and parcel of it. So here we see at the end of the uh, Day of Atonement in Revelation chapter 15 and 16, we saw that the seven last plagues were poured out. We talked a little bit about the pattern of this back in Exodus, where Moses and Aaron wanted to go out into the wilderness, wilderness, and keep a feast with a million people. There's all kinds of estimates of how many people there were, even if there was only a half a million or a few hundred thousand. Uh, it's still a lot of people to go out into the wilderness. They were going to go three days journey out into the wilderness and keep this feast. 
very likely, very likely, uh, that that would have been the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a judgment feast prior to that with the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. So this would have been a time of judgment for God and his people. And uh, we know what happened. The plagues were poured out uh, after that. And it looks to me like we have the pattern laid down in the Exodus story. We are coming to the second Exodus and we're, we can use that pattern. And here again, I say, between the sanctuary service and what has gone before us and the prophecies, we've got three things. We've got types as in the Exodus story, as in Noah's story, as in Sodom and Gomorrah's story. We've got types all the way down, which aren't really sanctuary types. They're just examples in Scripture, and we even see that in the book of Jude. It says that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is, a, is an example or a type of the destruction at the end. So we can, we've got all those stories in there that we can apply to things that are transpiring at the end. And we can also use the sanctuary as a story of the plan of salvation. And we see the pinnacle events through that. The, the easiest one to see at this point, because everyone that is a Bible believing person, uh, at least a New Testament type person that would embrace the Old and the New Testament, they can see Yeshua clearly in those prophecies. Um, we were looking at Isaiah 53 the other day. Uh, many other prophecies that Yeshua is in there. Uh, as well as the sanctuary service as being the Lamb of God, which John the Baptist was preaching. So between the examples as like Noah and the Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the sanctuary service, and the prophecies of the time of the end. We've got three avenues that we can clearly see. And I want to emphasize this. There is no excuse whatsoever for God's people not to clearly recognize where we are in time. The only reason why they will not recognize is because they're listening to the enemy saying, oh no, we've got all that figured out. And it's, it's interesting that when we get to Revelation chapter 3, uh, there's a little story about the last church that says, I am rich and increased with goods and am in need of nothing. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. We're all in need of everything. Uh, we don't want to echo that one, but apparently that's going to be spoken and I talk to people all the time that tell me that, so I know firsthand. So we have the seven last plagues being poured out. Uh, we also talked about deliverance, the resurrection, Passover, first fruits, Daniel 12, uh, 12 and 13 talks about um, blessed is he who comes to 1335. And uh, speaking of the resurrection, and then it said Daniel will rise to his inheritance at the end of days. And so when we compare this, lo and behold, uh, from trumpets and atonement, if this is actually day 1150, we can count, uh, subtract 1150 from 1335, and it puts us right at Passover. So I don't think, uh, I mean, I didn't work this out as far as making up these numbers. These are the numbers we have. We're looking at the typology. The resurrection typology happens in the spring. That's the way it was in scripture. That's the way it was in the sanctuary. And we can expect God is working on the calendar exactly the same way he always has because he does not change because he doesn't want to change it up with his people. Because his people, his people have actually learned the lessons of the past. They've learned the lesson that God's people messed up the prophecies at the first coming. They were expecting something else than what they said. 
and also they were confused of the typology of the sanctuary. So on those two points, uh, they messed up. But evidently, I believe, or not evidently, I do believe, that God's people, whoever they might be, will learn that lesson of the past, and they will go to work to figure out these prophecies. Why is that important? Because the statement that I read earlier, it says that because they don't understand these prophecies, that they will enter the time of trouble unready. Who wants to enter the time of trouble unready? If you don't really care, you might want to read about that time of trouble. And I can assure you, you do not want to be unready for that time. All right. So, who cares? Because this is so far out in the future, it really doesn't matter. Um, whoa, somebody <laughs> said it's not so far. Okay, so the events connected with the close of probation are clearly presented. Now, what I'm saying here is the close of probation is on 11, day 1150, and it starts at the time the daily is taken away. This is what we want to focus on today. What is this talking about? Because if we don't know the starting point of all of this, it really doesn't matter anyways. And the fact is, is that most people don't know the day, uh, what the daily is, although it's pretty clear in Daniel. When Daniel's in reference to the daily, there just happens to be a prophecy in chapter 6. Yes, I did say a prophecy. Daniel chapter 1 through 6 are Daniel's life experiences in Babylon and Persia. But it's interestingly uh, noted that chapter 1 to, through 6 are prophetic insights into what's going to happen in the time of the end. It was in chapter 6 that Daniel's daily experience was taken away. And uh, this is quite interesting because Daniel refers to the daily again in Daniel chapter 8. And Daniel was not allowed to pray to any god. Well, is there any prophecies that suggest that this little horn power that we spoke about yesterday is going to change God's times of appointment? That's what it says, Daniel 7.25, he shall think to change times and laws. And that's not any old times and laws, that's God's times and laws. And what do God's times and laws have to do with anything? Well, here's what they have to do with. The sanctuary service would be idle and there would not be any people moving in and around the sanctuary if it were not for God's appointed times. You see, in the morning and the evening was when the priest went to work. They uh, put a new lamb on the altar. They stoked the fire. And then in the evening, the time of the evening sacrifice, they would put another new lamb and they would stoke the fire and they kept this thing going. That's why it was called the daily. Another word for the daily is continual. They were not allowed to let the fire go out. This is pretty significant. Because what does it mean? It has to mean that we cannot let the fire go out on our altars. And I had a fellow come to the camp one time and he says, I want to know where the altar is because I heard you were sacrificing animals up here. Well, it's called camp to me, but it doesn't mean we're sacrificing animals. Um, so, so the idea being is that all of God's appointed times are being restored at the time of the end. That's actually why we called our, our uh, camp camp to me, because it seems to me that that's the last appointed time to be restored. Why is in God's grace, why has he done it like this? Well, I think I would have a unanimous, uh, uh, a unanimous decision in here that God's daily appointed time is probably the hardest appointed time to keep uh, because it interrupts your daily schedule. And so it takes a while to develop a habit uh, to do this, and we're probably all developing that habit uh, 
more and more all the time. And we're developing how we keep it, just like we develop how we kept the Sabbath when we first found out about it, and how we've grown in our understanding of how to keep it. I don't claim to have the secret on all of this stuff. I'm learning as I go. But the idea being here is Daniel chapter 6 is a prophetic insight to taking away the daily. Because if you don't have a daily experience, that's what the morning and evening sacrifice was, if you don't have a daily experience with God, it doesn't really matter which other ones you keep because you don't have an experience with God. So, um, and, and I say this kind of reverently in a way because in times past, God has winked at the ignorance of people. So I'm not saying that people that don't keep the feasts or people that don't keep the daily don't have an experience with God. What I'm suggesting here is that God is trying to move us into a place where our religious experience with him deepens as we go. And that's what I see this restoration that Yeshua talked about, about all things and leading us and guiding us into all truth is for the purpose of leading us closer to the throne room of God, which we can't really miss that point. It be becomes very, very important. So those that are bracing themselves to resist the work of the Holy Spirit, which is, according to Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, tells us that the work of the Holy Spirit is to cause us to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. And of course, when we look at the appointed times, they are part of God's law, his statutes and judgments. And they encompass much more than just the Ten Commandments, but when you look and investigate the judgments, you can take all these judgments that God is asking us to do, and I'm not talking about the sacrificial animal uh, laws. I'm talking about other things uh, like the festivals, like if you go into the woods and you need to relieve yourself. You don't leave toilet paper all over the place. And you know what I'm talking about. I have to say this because it's so ridiculous that you need to get the point. There are lots of other laws in the Torah that apply to any one of the Ten Commandments. And so you can connect them. There's another law that says if your animal breaks into somebody's property and eats all of their uh, produce or causes destruction, then you have to make that good to him. Well, what, what uh, Ten Commandment would that be? Well, one of the things I would think was loving your neighbor as yourself, which Yeshua said, all the commands hang on that. So that would fall under that. But specifically, one of the Ten Commandments that that could fall under, if your animal has destroyed something of somebody else's and you don't restore it, it would be kind of like theft, I think. Um, is that, does that make any sense? And uh, if, you were, if you had a flat-roofed house and you had people going up on the flat-roof house, the Bible says in the Torah that you need to put a fence around there so that people don't fall off and get hurt. What would that come under? Well, that could come under thou shalt not kill. So you can see that all of these commandments that have to do with daily life and our association with others are for our protection. And so those are how we uh, interact with other people. But God has a calendar of events when we come and worship before him. So if you do away with the calendar of events, the when of worship, all of a sudden, technically, we have no whens of worship. And so there is no worship, and that's what Yeshua said. In vain they worship God, following what? The doctrines or the commandments of men. And this is what we end up doing when we turn our back on the Torah. We're worshiping God according to our own preference or dictates. And in actual fact, we're creating God in our own image. People don't really think in terms like that. But really, when you start to analyze what people are doing, they're not worshiping God at all. They're worshiping according to what they want to do. 
And we certainly don't want to do that because we know, for a fact, during this time, it has to do with the changing of times and laws, which focus in on uh, our worship to our Creator in a way that He has laid out in Scripture. There's no guessing on when that is. So let's, um, we want to set some stage here. If we go back to Matthew 24, this is what I want to do here. We want to have uh, sort of a concise, something that people can grab onto and, uh, and see rather clearly if we can. Matthew 24, Yeshua is asked a question. And the question is, in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, those four, came to him privately. That's why it says privately. We don't understand the privately thing until we get to, I believe it's Mark, uh, where we see exactly who it is. And that's because they seem to be on the inner circle, the ones closest to Yeshua. So they went and talked to him about all of this, that not st one stone will be upon another. And they asked a question. Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? I have to believe that the question asked is related to the answer that's given. Does that make sense to anyone here? Is that when you ask God a question, he's going to give you an answer that relates to your question. And so the question is, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? You put those two things together and they equate each other. They're both happening at the same time. And the disciples knew that. That's why they asked. They wanted to know, when is he coming? At what time are you going to set up the kingdom to Israel? These are all of the things that are on their mind right now. And of course, we know for a fact, it's been 2,000 years approximately, plus or minus, and these things have not happened yet. What I mean by these things is his coming nor the end of the age. They have not happened yet. So now he gets into the answer, and I have to believe that the answer he gives them is in direct relation to the question they asked. And I sort of have some Bible on this because when Andrew asked him to pray, he didn't start talking about something else. He taught them how to pray. Our Father, that's what came out of that question. And that's the way God works. He likes to answer our questions directly. And once we start to see that, it, it starts to make a lot more sense. So Yeshua goes into this idea that don't let anyone deceive you. Deception is going to be the most important thing, and it's rampant today. I've seen it. Um, I know people that would think that I'm deceived. That's because everyone's confused, it would seem. And uh, the problem is that I find all the time when I tell people, you know, um, when we have questions come in, uh, they, they're accusing uh, the brethren of not knowing what they're talking about, but my plea is, show me from the word of God where we're misinterpreting things. And of course, no one seems to be able to do that. We just like throwing stones when we don't agree with people. That is the wrong attitude that we need to have. We need to come to people with scripture and show them where their error is. And if you're not willing to come and show someone in scripture where their error is, then we better not throw stones because we have no grounds to throw stones on. And that's just a little bit of heads up for all of us. If we're going to criticize somebody, we better have scripture to back it up. And not only that, we need to, if we're going to talk about people behind their back, we better let them know 
uh, that we don't agree with them and the reasons why. And it can't be just because I don't believe what you're saying. There has to be more grounds uh, to not believe something. We need scripture to back up everything. Okay, so it says in verse 5 of chapter 24, Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass first, but the end is not yet. Okay, what's going to happen first? Somebody tell me what he said was going to happen first. Wars, good. Okay, so this whole thing, according to what Yeshua said, wars and rumors of wars. And in other places it says, don't be terrified. In other words, this is not just any old war in history, not the First World War, not the Second World War, or all any of those wars that have gone before us. It's not just any old war. So we need, if we can pinpoint the war it's talking about, we're going to be able to know for sure that we are moving towards the crisis. That's the important part. So if we get the start right, we know what follows. And that's what Yeshua goes on to say in Matthew 24, after he says all the events that have to do with his coming in the end of the age. He says, in verse 33, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Now I have to ask the question here. Did the disciples see all these things? Did they see all the things that were in Matthew 24? Well, if you're a preterist, you would say, yes, they did see all these things. And all of this is in the past. You see... Satan uses this preterist idea uh, quite a bit, and he uses it on, on people that are historicists in position of prophecy. And that is the position that most everything is in the past. We're just looking for a couple little things to happen in the future. All this has gone away. The 1290 is past. The 1335 is past. The 1260 days is past. In fact, all of this is gone in history, except for the seven last plagues. And I would say our deliverance, but then this is unknown, completely unknown. So it's all unknown, except for the seven last plagues and, of course, the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast fits in here, and we're going to be looking at that uh, as well. So Yeshua starts off with war. Now the question is, what war is it? Well, let's keep going just to read a few more verses here to get some, a little more context here. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all, thing, all these things must come to pass first, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So, wars first, I could write down famines, pestilences, earthquakes. We're talking disasters will follow disasters upon disasters. Now, if you knew there was going to be a famine in the land, what would you do? Make a trip to Costco, maybe? What if Costco was closed? What if these disasters are so intense that you can't go to the store? What would you do? Pray? Is that what you said? Pray. Would there have been possibly some preparation that you could have made to avert a crisis like famine within your family and your household? Is there anything that we can do to prepare for a famine? Do like Joseph. Good. There's another story that I didn't mention earlier. Joseph was warned by God 
Actually, Pharaoh was warned by God, and Joseph was put in charge, and Joseph was God's man, and what did he do? He put food away for the famine. I wonder if there are any lessons we can learn from, from Joseph. Quite possibly. There will be a time coming when there will be no preparation that we can make whatsoever, and I believe, as in the days of old, that when Elijah was fed by a raven, I think we're going to see those days again. But before that time, I think there's some preparation that might be a good idea to make. And as we see the war approaching, and we see what falls on the heels of the war, famine, pestilence, and earthquakes, and I think earthquakes is an abbreviation for natural disasters. I haven't got a text for that, but I think hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, all of that would come under that umbrella. And of course, science will be saying, oh, it's global warming, and that's what's causing all of this. Uh, but anyways, we're not going to get into that. Uh, so we have all these things following the war. And that tells us the extent of the war, because in severe crises and severe wars, famine follows and pestilence follows, and that's because of the scale or magnitude of the conflict that's gone before. So this is what we see. This is what starts at the time of the end. So this is what we're looking at right now, is we're looking at the possibility of a war beginning, and it says in verse 8, all these things, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So this here with what falls is the beginning of sorrows. So that word, can somebody help me out? What is the really the, the intent of what he just said there? The beginning of sorrows? Somebody give me another translation. Another translation. Pains in childbirth, and anyone that's been involved in any kind of childbirth knows that the contractions of a woman are sporadic at first. Braxton Hicks, is that what that's called? That's kind of a little earlier, but yeah. Yeah, it's like you, you know there's something going on, right? Sometimes there can even be a flood. Anyways, we won't get into that. But uh, the idea being is there are indicators that the time of deliverance is coming. And Yeshua uses birth pains, the, the um, description as this time being birth pains, and we know it starts off slow and then it gets more intense as we go. So I would say that this time, I'm just going to call this a time of trouble, a time of trouble, that's what Yeshua said, a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, the time of trouble will intensify greatly as we go. And the further we get to the end, the greater the time of trouble will get. So you will have a little bit of a time of trouble through here. If you've made preparation that we're, told to make. If we make this preparation, this time of trouble won't be as bad as it will be down, downtown, if you will, especially if you're downtown and you're God's people, trying to obey his law when laws are put in place that make it impossible for you to obey him. Uh, if you don't make the preparation to get out of town at that point, then this time of trouble will be severe for you but if there is preparation made, it's certainly not going to be as bad. One of the simplest ways that it's not going to be as bad, the first thing after war, is famine. So if you could be in a place where you could grow your own food in a safe place, not downtown, uh, because that's where the famine is going to be very, very severe. And of course, that's where wars are fought. Um, generally, they're not fighting out in the field, but it's going to come into uh, the cities and what have you. So that's, that's where you don't want to be. So then you get into the famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. That's this time right here. 
So we need to see something else just to show that we're kind of on the right track here. So then it says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations uh, for my name's sake. We read about that in Daniel chapter 7, where God's people will be persecuted. So we see that 1260-day period actually right here. That's what it's talking about. This is the time of persecution of God's people. This is the time that worldwide there will be a one world religion and we will have to worship according to the dictates of the state which will be controlled by the church or the recognized religion of the day. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. Now this is really a sad part of this prophecy, is those people that don't actually have a solid rock experience with their God, with Yeshua and the Father, are going to give up their faith and they will take it to the next level where they will betray those that do. And, um, you know, we can see this even today. We could see how this happens. Well, here's basically how it happens right here. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So those people that are operating on a different wavelength than what thus saith the Lord are going to deceive many. And the reason why they're going to deceive many, because many people actually don't know what God's word says because they're not actually reading it, and they're not testing everything they believe by God's word. So they don't have a rock to stand on when it comes to their faith, because they couldn't prove anything if their life depended on it. And so what they're going to do is they're just going to go with the flow, the easy way down the river, uh, and go with the flow. And it goes on to say, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now this word love, uh, if Judy, if you could look up that word love in that text for me in, in Matthew 24, 12. Yeah, th we don't want to miss this point because Yeshua is talking to his followers. We can't miss this. This whole chapter is for his followers so they will not be deceived. He said... Because lawlessness abounds. In other words, because people are not following God's law. And when I talk about following God's law, I'm not talking about following God's law on the outside of your being. I'm talking about following God's law on the inside of your being. I hope you get my point. So the, the idea here is, because God's law is not followed on the inside of our being, our love, our agape love, we're not talking about filial love or any, any other kind of love. We're talking about agape love, and that's the unconditional love that God has for us. And it is the same kind of love that if we're following God on the inside, that we will extend to others that agape love that unconditional love. We will love the other people. We may not live the sin that they're living in, but we will still have a righteous love for people. And because lawlessness abounds, because so many bad things are happening, persecution's happening, injustice is happening on every side, that agape love, Yeshua warns us, could grow cold and that's because of everything around us is evil and we don't want to have our agape love grow cold we need to keep the connection with him and I think my personal opinion is that's why the appointed times are being restored because they will keep us uh, from falling away they will help us not a guarantee but they will help us as we meet together and associate together at least in little companies as we see the day approaching so then he goes on to say in verse 14 
or 13, but he who endures to 70 AD shall be saved. The question that's asked is what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? This is a death nail in the coffin that we can put it to rest that this prophecy is more than just about 70 AD. In the context of what he's talking about, he, sa- he ends up the events that are going to happen before he comes. Don't grow cold. And he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Has the end come yet? Not the end according to the question. What is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? The answer, the end, is those that endure to the end against persecution and all odds, those that endure to the end will be saved. So then he goes on to say, therefore. So the therefore has to do with something that has transpired within the context of the time of the end. He ends at the end. The end will be in verse 14. And then he says, but when you see. So back during this dialogue that he's just had, this event is going to happen. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. A couple points here that we can't miss. Yeshua has asked the question about the time of the end, and he goes to Daniel, the prophet. That's got to be an example for us to follow. Let's go to Daniel, the prophet, and find where Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation. Lo and behold, it's in reference to the 1290. It's also in reference to the taking away of the daily, and it's also in reference to Daniel chapter 8 and the 1150. So we can see here that these events are placed somewhere between the war and the deliverance, I would say, I would claim, the deliverance is at the time of the resurrection and in the sanctuary, and in what actually happened at Yeshua's resurrection, the barley harvest, they went out and harvested a pre-selected bundle of barley, a sheaf of barley, and then Yeshua was raised on that day, and then he went out to the graves, and it says many were raised as well, that all being a type of the grand resurrection in the time of the end. Another interesting idea, too, in the time of Egypt, when, when Moses was going to leave Egypt, we know when he left Egypt, it was at Passover, and then he made a detour, which he could have made at any time before because they knew they were leaving, but just after they left, looks like a day or two after they left, they got down to Succoth and they picked up Joseph's bones. Well, I would propose that that is a type of resurrection because Joseph said before he died is that he wanted his bones to end up where? Somebody tell me. In the promised land. Where are these people going when the bones are raised up? They're going to the promised land. They're going to the promised land. So, you know, there are so many links in here that we can make. And, of course, we can't make them all. Time will not permit that. But we see here that that Yeshua points us back to Daniel. Daniel's prophecies in the abomination of desolation. So we want to look at all those prophecies. So if what I'm saying is actually correct then this prophecy that talks about the daily being taken away, that's in connection with all of these events, the daily being taken away, maybe we can find something in that prophecy that will help us in the time of the end. If you can go to the the slide, please. Daniel chapter 8, we see something very interesting. This is the chapter that the daily is taken away. We read those verses earlier from chapter uh, 8 in Daniel, verses 9 to 12. Now we're going to back up. If this is happening here, 
let's just back up a little bit in the prophecy. And lo and behold, we see Daniel is having this vision. And he sees a ram in verse 4. He says, I saw a ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will, and he became great. Now, it's interesting here. If you look, um, I don't know if I can do this. No, I don't even want to do it. Um, underneath the ram, you can see the Persian Gulf, where it says, what does it say there? Um, Arabia. And you can see Iran just on the bottom there. In the Persian Gulf, right at the top of the Persian Gulf, there's, there's three rivers that come together. One is the Hittikale, or the Euphrates, and the Tigris, um, which is there. So we have the Tigris, um, which I believe was anciently called the Hittikale, and then we have the Euphrates that runs right through Babylon. There's also another river uh, that, as far as I can tell, is called the Uli, and it anciently was called the Uli, and it runs into the same waterway and goes into the Persian Gulf. And this is, interestingly enough, where Daniel has two visions. This one here he sees on the Uli. He was transferred in vision to the Uli, so he sees the vision at the Uli, which is right at the head right at the top of the Persian Gulf. And also in Daniel chapter 10 through 12, he has another vision. In some translations, it's called a great conflict. Uh, and he's told in verse 14 of chapter 10 that Gabriel has come and to reveal what's going to happen to his people in the latter days. So we can see here the same context. And those chapters, 10 through 12, contain the... 1290 and the 1335. So we know we're in the right proximity to find out some information on these visions. So it says here that he's taken in vision to the Uli River and he sees this great conflict. In verse 5, it tells us that as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the Mediterranean without touching the ground and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Did I hear something? You're playing games again. It says that the goat comes across the surface of the whole earth. Well, why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. If we go up to verses 17... When Gabriel is instructed to make Daniel understand the vision, because Daniel obviously didn't understand it, one of the things he wants to make sure Daniel understands, he tells him twice, because I don't think he heard it the first time. And this is actually reasonable, because Daniel was grappling with all of this. And Gabriel tells him in verse 17 of Daniel chapter 8, so he came near where I, where I stood, and when he came near, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now the word refers to doesn't really have to be in, the, in there. Uh, we can eclipse it if we want. Understand, son of man, the vision to the time of the end. So my question is, is the whole vision at the time of the end? Or is it one or two verses at the time of the end? What is it? Well, in case we missed the point, we can read again in 19. And he said, look, I'm making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. So here again, the question is, what is the vision? And I know I used to teach that this 2300 spanned all across this whole vision, but it just doesn't square with what it says when you critically analyze it. And we have one more advantage, is that it says, 
Yeshua himself says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, he says, Daniel, seal up the book. It will not be understood until the time of the end. That's basically what he was telling him. And that is exactly what he's telling him now is this vision for his, uh, the time of the end. So now when we look at it in that context, we see something very clearly that this goat comes across, not the Mediterranean, but the whole earth. And this map that you see, there's probably not a person alive on the planet that has not, that's been educated, that does not know about this map. So is it possible at the time of the end, God knew that everyone would know what the cross the surface of the whole earth, and he would know, and everyone would know which direction was west and which direction was east, and, and so on. So we can, we can see clearly at the end of time that we have a goat coming across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and uh, he's going to make war with this ram. So who is the ram? Let's just kind of cut to the chase here, and uh, we can have a look at the ram. It says, the ram which you saw in verse 20, verse 20, the ram which you saw having two horns, they're the kings of Media and Persia. And so this has led people to say, well, this is Media Persian Empire. I understand that. That's really reasonable. However, it just doesn't fit if we want to put all the pieces in the right place. So there are the kings of Media and Persia. Why would God say that they're the kings of Media and Persia? The only reasonable conclusion I can come to is Daniel would not have known anything about Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, Lebanon, and... Um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, Egypt, well, he would have understood Egypt, but he wouldn't have understood all these other different countries. But when he spoke about the kings of Media and Persia, Daniel would have understood where those countries were or where those people were. And if we are to understand that in today's language, it would look much like this. This is the empire of the Medes and Persians, and the Persians were stronger than the Medes, and they actually ended up ruling the whole empire. And as you can see on your map, it stretched from Libya all the way across Egypt, across uh, Iraq, and, and the Middle East, uh, all of the Middle East, Persia, which today is Iran, also Pakistan and nor in northern India, up to Afghanistan and across the southern uh, Russian states, uh, Turkmenistan and all those other stands would also be included in this. And lo and behold, in the time of the end, if you were to place the countries on these borders, you would see exactly the countries of Libya, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Now, I have to ask the question, do these countries have any ill will towards Israel and the United States? We know something about these countries. They are dominated by um, the religion of Islam. And... Uh, I'm not talking against any people here. I have no prejudice, color, creed, or whatever. But according to God's word, the West is going to square off against Islam. Now, I have to ask another question. Is there any indication that that's even a remote possibility today for the West to have a conflict with Islam? Well, I propose that if you don't think so today, just keep watching the news, and I think you'll become convinced of what's happening. We see movements in Islam today that they are moving away from the West and growing closer to China and, and Russia. 
Now, why are they doing this? Are they going to be lifelong allies with Russia and China? No, the answer to that question is definitely not. But they are using, they are using Russia and China today because Russia and China have an enemy as well. And it happens to be the same enemy as those in the Middle East. They have an enemy, and that is the West. And so why is this? Well, it's not known totally why it is, but I would propose it has something to do with three brethren. One is Ishmael, one is Isaac, and one, is, one are those that are brothers of Yeshua. It's a family feud that is coming to a head in the time of the end, and it's going to be focused in the Middle East. This is what it's all about. This is what the Bible is. It's a book that focuses in on the Middle East. And Jerusalem will be the final um, landing spot for all conflict. And that's why uh, Yeshua points us to this. So he's pointing us to this war. So I would propose that these, um, the kings of Media and Persia, as in the prophecy, are the two horns that are on this ram. And it says the two horns are high and the higher one comes up last, that being the Persian Empire because it encompassed everything at the, at the end of its empire. And Daniel would have understood this in, in his day to be this area of the map. But certainly here at the time of the end, we can overlay Media and Persia on today's map and we find out those are all the Middle Eastern countries that are predominantly Islam and predominantly enemies of the West. So now we get to another map, and this is a world map of Islam and where Islam dominates. You can see the darker green is 90 to 100% Islam. So all across Northern Africa and uh, of course across the Middle East, but then you get down into Indonesia and those countries down there, you see it's very dark as well. Uh, I believe uh, Indonesia has something like 250 million uh, Muslims in that area, something like that. So it's, uh, it's all through the Middle East, but Islam, because they have a mandate to control the world and create Sharia law everywhere, and Allah will be the God, you see, they have a, a mandate, much like Christians, that they are going to evangelize the world, and this is exactly what we see going on right now, is they are infiltrating the whole world. But they're not coming to America to be Americans in the truest sense of the word. They're not becoming part of our society uh, and coming to America for the reasons why America became the greatest nation. They want to control the world, and this is true. This is what they believe is that Allah will one day reign over the whole world and there to, uh, they are, are asked, just the same way Yeshua asked us, go into all the world and make disciples. They are going into all the world because Allah has asked them to make disciples of all nations. And it's very interesting that where Christians are coming to an end time scenario, Islam is as well, and so we're going to face off with them on which ideology is going to win out. And that's why we have this problem with this ram and he goat in the time of the end. And so we get, we need to find out who the goat is. And it says here in verse 21 that the male goat, verse 21 of chapter 8, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece and the large horn is is the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king and for the broken horn okay so as for the broken horn so this first king becomes group broken we want to talk about that as well but before we do we just want to talk about what this situation is that we have in this goat it says in verse um uh five of that chapter, it says the goat had a notable horn on between its eyes. Notable is noticeable or something, it's a, it can be a comparative term. In other words, 
there's other horns as well. And we see this in verse 8. We see four notable ones or four uh, comparatively larger horns come up and take the place of the broken horn. So my point, the reason why I bring that up is because this kingdom is made up of many kings, but there's five dominant kings. This is, this is really important. This is what the prophecy says. There is one notable horn, and there's four horns in the wings, so to speak. They just don't appear out of nowhere. They are there when the large horn is there as well. But, it, but the idea is, if they're also notable horns, there are other horns or other kingdoms that are traveling along with the goat as well at this time. But the notable horn, it says, is broken. And it says he's the king of Greece. But this king of Greece, if you take it back into the translation, it's actually Javan. And we need to go back into Genesis because this is... This is extremely important, and um, it helps us to understand this. And this goes along with the point that I made with the kings of Media and Persia. Here at the time of the end, we're looking at Greece as a possibility. Now, if we look at Greece today, I mean, they almost went bankrupt. I'm not sure if they, they are yet today, but they're not in good financial uh, condition. So it can't possibly be talking about Greece. But what is it talking about? When it talks about Greece, it, Daniel didn't, didn't actually say it was Greece. He said it was Javan. So we go back to Genesis chapter 10. And we see here, it's very interesting that God has this recorded in the word. In chapter 10, it talks about the genealogy, verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, Japheth, the sons of Noah were born to them after the flood. So we get to the sons of Javan here. And it says, or the sons of Japheth. Sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, Medea, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Terrace. And when we get to Javan... We go up to verse 4, and this is specifically mentioned here. Sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanan. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands according to their own language, according to their families, into their nations. So where did the coastland peoples go? They went west. And that it tells us that Tarsus, Kittim, and these places were west through the Mediterranean. And we are actually a product of those people. They went west into the Mediterranean, into Europe. And then from Europe, they came over to the west. And this actually fits the prophecy perfect when it says, the goat comes across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. So we see here that this actually is the war that Yeshua spoke about in the time of the end. I want to go back to our map, uh, first of all. We've got our, our map there. And so we see that this map, we see something very interesting, the 1040 window. The 1040 window is right where northern Africa is, all the way across there, all it takes in all the Islamic nations and also China and the Far East. That's the 1040 window. If we're going to have the little horn which it says consumes the whole earth, then that window has to flip. It has to change sides. A defeat in a war with Islam would be partially, uh, that would be accomplished and then it will work east from that and take in China. And once China is converted, and I'm not talking about converted as far as an actual conversion experience, much like uh, Constantine, his conversion experience I would question, but he adopted uh, a fallen Christianity to enhance or to hold up his kingdom and remain in power. So this is what we see in the East 
is that when the little horn takes control, even the east in China will accept that system, and that's when the little horn, when that is accomplished, the little horn will have gained control of the whole world. And that's quite evident in, in chapter 8 also, when we have a division into four horns, which are four kingdoms. And in verse 9 it says, Out of one of them came a little horn, and it grew exceedingly great toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the glorious land. So if we're entertaining the idea that this is actually for the end of time, then if you go to Rome, Italy, if the harlot is the papacy, if you go south, where do you end up? From Italy. Can you see where that is? If you go directly south, and then you go east, as far as China, then you go where? To the glorious land. Those are the only areas that the papacy would have to convert to their way of thinking or submit to their authority to end up in Jerusalem. Just putting some ideas out here. So we see a war with the Middle East, and we see a little more information in chapter 11 of Daniel. A little more information on this war. Starts off in, uh, at the end of 10, which is an explanation of where the vision is going. Doesn't talk about the vision per se. But in verse 21 of chapter 10 of Daniel, it says, But I tell... I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. What is noted, past, past tense. So Gabriel's going to tell Daniel something that's been previously noted in scripture of truth. Well, let's compare and see what scripture this may be talking about. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. So here's where he starts to unpack this, what's noted in the scripture of truth. Now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Czechoslovakia. Oh, Persia. Oh, okay. So three more kings will arise in Persia. And the fourth shall be far richer than them all. And by his strength, through his riches... He will stir up all against the realm of Greece. Well, it doesn't say Greece. It's the same word as in Daniel 8. It's Javan. So uh, evidently, in the time of the end, which is what Daniel 8 says, Daniel, this, is, this vision's for the time of the end, that the Medes and the Persians, he's, this now is the description, and one horn was higher the Persian horn was higher, and the higher came up last. So the, this is explaining that the whole Persian Empire now has come together as it was back in Daniel's day and, and after Daniel's day when it became the height of its empire. It says there that by his strength, this fourth king shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he will stir up all against the realm of Greece. I have to conclude that this fourth king that's far richer than them all in that whole empire where the Medes and the Persian reign today would be Saudi Arabia. So when Saudi Arabia turns against the West, we can expect a gathering together of the Muslim nations. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that Saudi Arabia is turning its back on the West and is making other alliances outside. It also needs to be noted that it's making an alliance with Iran. They are now exchanging emissaries and they're going back and forth having discussions to try and bring all of Islam together. Why would they need to do that? They need to do that to fulfill God's word in what the prediction is in God's word. Islam will take their stand in the world it, and they will have a united front. The whole world, it says here, this is what it says, 
through his riches, he shall stir up all, all of the ram, which is governed by, Isla, which is governed by the kings of Media and Persia. We've got all the ram as Islam. Now just have a look at that map. All of the ram as Islam. At this time, this is what the map looks like, but on a daily basis, every time I go to Kelowna, where I usually go to get groceries, I am seeing more Islamic people every time I go. And the way today has been opened for them to go everywhere in the world. This is a UN mandate. This is what's happening all over the world. Canada is allowing more immigrants to come in. And a lot of those immigrants, probably most of those immigrants, are coming from Islamic countries. And this is what we see in the United States. This is a movement that's growing. And I, I would suggest that the reason why Islam is going into all the world is because they have a mandate to fulfill. And they're just waiting to get everyone into place uh, before they do what they're going to do. So this says that the greatest kingdom of the Islamic nations is going to rally all against the West. And this is what Yeshua spoke about. And that's why I, I say again, he points us back to Daniel to find the beginning. So the beginning of all of this, I would say, is a war that brings all of Islam and the West together. But not only the West, it will also bring China and Russia under its umbrella as well. Because when Islam says it's go time, in other words, to make the whole world under Allah's uh, jurisdiction, China and Russia are not going to go along with that. And China and Russia have their own issues when it comes to Islam. Uh, if you're watching the news, you, can, you know that. I understand in Moscow alone, there could be upwards to 2 million Islamic people as migrant workers uh, in Russia. And of course, the Russian southern republics uh, under the USR were all Islamic countries as well. So uh, Russia is influenced a lot, uh, and this is why. They take their position with Iran and, and these other countries because they are close to them geographically and uh, as allies against the West. But that's going to fall away at some point. Okay, Russia has the largest, uh, Judy just brought this up, Russia has the largest population in Europe Muslim population in Europe, estimated at 25 million in 2018, according to the Grand Mufti of Russia. So Russia is actually in a far more serious, thank you for that. Russia is in a far more serious position if, if it was go time for Islam to do what they're mandated to do by Allah, Russia is going to be in serious trouble because Russia, they're infidels as far as the, um, the Islamic faith is concerned, but they are uh, using them as an ally today because they're fulfilling part of their purpose in their expansion uh, all over the world. And so we can see this. In, in my mind, I, I can see this happening for sure. So this war will be fought by five major powers, and that's what it says. It says the goat has one notable horn and four smaller horns. It comes from the west across the surface of the whole earth. Um, and if we could just, uh, yeah, take that slide. So this is what we see here in the time of the end, that they do war with this power. And I believe that these five notable horns that spoke about, the notable horn, and then the five other horns are represented in the UN as the permanent members. That would be China, uh, Great Britain, France, Russia, and the United States. They are the five major powers that make up the, the brunt of the power in the UN, the five permanent members. Um, strongest nations in the world 
when Islam squares off, they will have all their people in place and they will be in a position that they will think they're going to win and they will pull the trigger. And this is, this is what we can expect according to the prophecies. Now, if this actually happens, a lot of people don't want to believe this could happen because this is going to be a war that is going to be extremely severe. We're talking about um, terrorism on a scale that we can't really imagine. We can't really imagine. In the research that I've been able to do, which is definitely not all the research that's possible, is I understand that Islam, when they plan, they plan not in terms of a few years or 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 100 years. They plan in terms of thousands of years. Completely different from the West because we're not really that old as far as a nation is concerned. But their nation goes back thousands of years. And so that's kind of the way they plan. So they've been planning a takeover of the world for not just 50 years, but for over a thousand years. That's when the Persians ruled the Middle East and that was, they were expanding, but they were kept in check by who? By the crusades of the Christian church. Well, guess what? We're in for another crusade. Only this time, it's going to be on a world scale. And uh, yeah, we need to be prepared for this. That's what Yeshua said. Get prepared. And we need to make preparation for this time. But out in the wilderness is not where all the activity is going to be. So it will be somewhat safer. And this is what it tells us in Revelation chapter 12, is the woman, God's church, found refuge in the wilderness where she was protected for a time, times, and a dividing of times. So this is, this is what we need to be looking at. So we can see here clearly how this is going to happen. Then in verse 3 in chapter 11, it says, when everything is starting to expand... And the whole Middle East now and the whole Islamic world is stirred up to go against the realm of Greece. This is just before the triggers are pulled. It says, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. If this is speaking of the time of the end, who possibly could this be? I'm thinking for sure Prince Charles. What about anybody else? He's a king, but he lacks the mighty part. I get, along, I get that. You know, sometimes I say things just to make my point so obvious. This could be a president. It could be a prime minister. But it's a leader. It's a world leader will arise at this time when Islam has reached its height of power, when it's pushing in all directions that we see. It says that there's a mighty king that arises and does according to his will. Do you know any mighty king out there today that would be willing to face off against Islam? and partner up to protect Israel. Is there a mighty king today that is in place that could do this? Anyone? Well, maybe not today, but I'm gonna make a prediction here that I believe to be true, and I'm not the only one saying this, is that there is a mighty king that will rule, that has ruled in the past, and I believe will rule in the future, I believe that this mighty king, the only guy that will fit this description, 
has to be a mighty king that is, that is governing the most powerful nation on the planet. Okay, so we need, to, we need to pull some of this together here. All joking aside, it's to make a point. It's to really make a point. Is that we're facing off, looking at this war, not very far down the road. That's actually what puts all of this in context. Let's finish up, shall we? So if the West wins the war which the prophecy indicates, it tramples on the ram, and there's no one that can deliver the ram from its power. It tramples him completely. Islam is done. Now, if you go back to that uh, slide, the one just back, when Islam is defeated, basically, we don't destroy all the Islamic people. We convert them. So they will be converted now because Islam will be totally wiped out as a religion and then the new world order will come in and there will be said that there will be only one religion in the world because we're going to do away with all the wars that are even possible in the future and by doing away with all religion and bringing in a state approved religion uh, it would do away with wars and that's when they will say peace and safety and and all that goes along with that so if Islam is defeated, what do you suppose Israel would do? They would build a temple. Absolutely. They're going to build their temple. Because Islam will be displaced, they will be allowed to build their temple, which they are preparing even now, and they will be allowed to build their temple. Now I ask again another question. What would they do at that temple? What would they be doing at the temple? They will reinstitute the sac sacrificial system, and they will uh, require all Jews to, to fulfill their role in that system. And I rather suspect there will be a lot of uh, people that will think they need to go to Jerusalem and do sacrifices uh, as well. And so this will happen. This will happen after the war. Israel will be allowed to build their temple, and then once the little horn gains power, once its influence goes further into the world, they will, as Daniel chapter 8 says, they will make their way to the glorious land. Once they have put a foothold in the glorious land, and uh, it tells us that they're going to do this, also in Revelation chapter 11 tells us this same thing, once they do that, they will put a stop because they're a Christian organization, fallen as it may be, but they're a Christian organization uh, claiming to believe that Yeshua is the Lamb of God. They will put a stop to this system, and that will be the taking away of the daily sacrifice, but that'll do away with everything else. So what happened in the time of Constantine, if we can learn anything from history, when the Roman power got control over that section of the world, through Constantine, through that whole area, they made laws that it was illegal to, for anyone to keep the Passover, to keep tabernacles, to keep anything Jewish, and, uh, and we can expect that to happen again. We can learn that lesson of history, that when this power gets control, this apostate form of Christianity gets control, they will not only do away with the Jews, but anyone that does anything like the Jewish people, and this is exactly what happened to the Christians in the early church in Rome, they were fed to the lions because they couldn't tell them apart from the Jews. Why couldn't they tell them apart from the Jews? Because they kept Sabbath, and they kept the feasts, and they kept clean and unclean meats as well. So these are little lessons of history that we can learn uh, for what's coming. So to sum it all up, according to Yeshua, war, famine, pestilence, during this time of confusion in the world, Israel will be doing something. They will build the temple. The reason why they want to build the temple is not to sacrifice again only. They want to build their temple for the coming of the Messiah. That's why 
They want to build their temple. And because of what has just happened, it will appear that the Messiah is coming is very close. So they need to get this temple done. They will start their system again. But the papacy will gain itself in power and ending up uh, putting its hold on Jerusalem, doing away with this system, setting up its own system of one world uh, religion, and then all these things will follow. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at this, how this is developing, what Saudi Arabia is doing, what Iran is doing, what China, what uh, all these movements, uh, we can tell because they are fitting into the prophetic word. So with that, let's uh, ask for uh, a closing word of prayer here, and then we can have to, some discussion. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that the events connected with the close of probation are clearly portrayed in the prophecies. We ask that you continually open this prophetic word to our understanding, that we can not only prepare for it ourselves, but we can help others be prepared for it. We pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.